Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, I would definitely like to say thank you for asking me to come here today. I appreciate that. I am Teresa Timmerman. Because we are doing it as, on Zoom, as I talked about, we're going to have everyone hold their questions to the end, but by all means, um, there'll be time for questions, okay? Um, I'm just gonna go through a few things. This is definitely an introduction to beekeeping because beekeeping, there are many, many, many different layers. So you might say, oh, okay, I, I really wanted to know about X and you know that wasn't part of it. Um, by all means, I'm willing to help with that too, but it was kind of, how do you do an introduction in 45 minutes? So I'm gonna do the best I can. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, Am I an expert? Absolutely not. As far as I am concerned, um, and it's my opinion, no one is a bee expert until you've done it for many, many years. And the reason you'll find that out is because there's certain things with honeybees that you might only do once a year, or it might not happen in that particular year. So for someone to say, oh, I've done beekeeping for three years or five years, as far as I'm concerned, they're not experts because there's so many things you might not run into. When you run into them, then you're gonna say, okay, I remember that. <laughs> but it's just a couple of those things. Um, I've been beekeeping for two and a half years. And as I said, yes, I do live up here on the hill. Um, we have three hives and I'll go into a little bit more detail about why we do that. A lot of people, when they think of beekeeping, they actually think of, okay, A, you think of honey, everybody thinks of honey. Um, and then the next thing's usually getting stung. And I'm gonna talk about that. Um, we always think about our flowers. We think about pollen, we think about summer. We think about white bee suits. And the reason people wear a white bee suit, a lot of people say, why do you wear white? And the reason is you can see I'm sitting here in black and white. If I actually went up to my beehive and I'm all dressed in black, that actually signals to the bees predator because when you think of black, what do you think of? You think of a bear. Right, so a lot of people you'll see them wear white, and that's why because it's not. You also don't want to go out there in yellow. You know, you don't want to go out there and look like pollen, right? <laughs> um, so I'm hoping today to actually show you a few things. Of when I actually got into this, I found a lot of things really fascinating that I had no idea about. And like the comment earlier, um, recognizing a honeybee in itself is point number one. <laughs> Because it is true. A lot of people go, oh, I, I mean, I've been called to people's homes and I'm glad to go to their homes, but they'll say, Teresa, will you come over? I think there's a honeybee being nest at my home, blah, blah, blah. It, it's always been a wasp nest. Um, but it's just, I understand why people ask. And it's just one of those things. I took a lot of courses before I started, before I even started to have the bees around. Because again, that's one of the things that I'm really big on research and knowledge, etc. Within a hive, the number one thing to know right off the bat is there are three different kinds of bees. There's the queen, the worker, and the drone. And I am gonna talk about all of them. Honey bees are super, super social. And they're actually, they are an insect. And I'm not gonna go into why they're an insect and all that good stuff, but they're actually eurosocial. And what that means is they live in a group. They actually divide out their labor and the labor is divided by whether the fact is the queen, the worker or the drone. And the members specialize. So when they live, you know, it's a very communal environment. They'll have some that'll care for the young. They'll have nest construction. Somebody looks after the hive and tries to defend it. They forage for food. In every hive you see sitting around someone's house, you know, at least in one hive, there are at least 10,000 honeybees. So right away for me to say I have three hives, I know minimum on my property, there are 30,000 honeybees. So it just kind of gives you an idea. But because they live in the environment they live in, if a bee's on its own too long, it won't survive. It can't. Within the hive, the number one is what I'm gonna say is the queen bee. And that's where that saying comes back older than the queen bee, right? If you look at this picture, I don't know if you can see, but right in the center, you can see one bee that's longer than the others. And that is the queen. 
and there is only one queen bee that actually is active in a hive. And they are the mother of the hive. They're the only one in the hive that has any sexual development. So a lot of people look at it going, oh, they're like rabbits. No, they aren't <laughs> actually. And I'm gonna explain that. So that queen bee, her primary role is reproduction. That's it. She doesn't leave the hive except for once in her life, maybe twice. And I'll explain that to you. So one of the things that the queen does is after, and I'm gonna talk about how they're born, but after she actually, say she emerges from her cell, she leaves the hive once and she leaves only to mate. And what actually happens is the drone, which is the male, there will be a number of them somewhere else. They'll either be in another hive or they're just kind of congregated somewhere else. There'll be a number of them and they will wait for a queen bee. They actually reproduce in the air, which is, that's actually where they have their sexual interaction. Believe it or not, it's way up high. Um, so she will actually, that the reason she doesn't mate with drones in their own hive makes total sense. You want to actually have your genetics expand. They know that in nature. But one queen will mate with an average of 12 drones in the air. And this will occur over two to four days. So that's her big piece of time when she leaves that hive. But when she comes back, within 48 hours, she starts laying eggs. And what's really interesting about her eggs, I'm going to talk about how many, but what actually happens with her is she actually releases pheromones that actually have the scent. So everyone knows they, they actually smell that queen. That's their hive. That's their home. I'm going to tell you a little story. As I go through this, I'm going to interject some stories. So I didn't realize how key the pheromone scent was. I knew it was important, but I didn't realize how key it was. So after I'd been doing hives for about a year and a half, I lost one of my queens and it's all going to how I lost her after. But what actually happened was I had to introduce a new queen. And this get up here that I have, I'll have the pants on, the suit, the hood, but I, usually, I don't usually put my hood on till I'm maybe, you know, 100 feet away because I'm walking around. I know they're not going to come at me usually. But what I was doing was I had the queen bee in a brown paper bag because that's how you go pick them up. And then they're in a little cell inside that. Didn't have my cover on. They could smell her. So they came right for me because there was one particular hive that needed a queen. And I then became the threat. So there I am with this queen in this bag and I don't have my hood on. And where'd they go? They went right from my face. So I am gonna talk about stings, but did I get stung? I did. And will I ever do that again? Absolutely not. <laughs> so you do, as I said, there's things where I said, are you an expert? No, I never realized that they were going to smell that new queen so far away when I hadn't even released her from her little cell that was inside that paper bag. So again, why do you want to learn from things? You want to know things like that. So her, for, her pheromones are super cute for those bees. They know how, if she's, if there's something wrong with her, they're going to know because they can't smell it. A queen will start to fail within two to three years. So that queen's not going to last forever. And that's actually what happened with mine. I had actually purchased my hives from someone else that was moving. And because they were moving, there was already a queen in there. So when she actually came to my property, she was getting older. And so she did something that was called swarm that I'll talk about in a bit. A drone is also in the hive and they are the male honeybees. Now, interesting enough, a male honeybee cannot sting you. They do not have the ability to do it. So first of all, number one, the drone also, they don't clean the hive. If a drone is the lucky drone in the hive that gets to mate, as soon as they mate, they die. So first of all, they don't clean. You know, if they're the lucky one, they die. And at the end of the summer, the hive wants to reduce itself down. They know cold weather's coming. The drone doesn't do anything. So in most cases, they get rid of them. 
So the drone really is not a desirable role as far as I'm concerned. And what you'll see in the spring is when you go to your hive in the spring, you'll see a lot of dead honeybees. And they're the drones. They have been pushed out by the rest of the hive. It's like, get out, we're not gonna feed you all winter. And then there's the worker bees. The worker bees are the females and they keep everything running really smooth. They're the ones, doesn't that make sense? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> they draw out the comb. They pre prepare all the cells for the queen to lay her eggs. They take care of larva as it's growing. They clean up the debris, they protect it. They go get the nectar. They're the ones that you actually see out. You're, it's, there will almost always be a female worker bee on the pollen. They actually will get the water. And that's why everyone says they're not called the workers for nothing. A lot of these photos you'll see, um, I actually took a university course at Penn State. So some of the photos are from there. Some are my own, um, some are from a agency called Unsplash, just so you know where they kind of came from. So as they age, they go into becoming either a nurse bee or a house bee. And then the final stage is they're the foragers. But during the foraging stage, time of their life, that only lasts six weeks. Bees don't live as long as people think. So when it gets to that stage, they have about six weeks of age left. Can anyone be a beekeeper? I'm asked this quite often, kind of, oh, I'm interested in it. Anyone who, and first of all, yes, anyone can. But if you're a beekeeper and you're in possession of those honeybees, you have to register with the um, Ontario Ministry of Agriculture Food and Rural Affairs. And it's actually against the law if you don't. And a lot of people will say, well, I'm just a backyard beekeeper. And that's what I would call myself because I only have three hives. But still, even if you have one hive, it has to be registered. Key pieces that I think people need to know if they want to start into beekeeping, find a mentor. And this to me is number one. Because when I got into this, you are, at least I was, you're very nervous in the beginning. And you think a lot of things are like, oh, what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. If you can talk to someone who else has already been doing beekeeping, I had a mentor here. He was a wonderful gentleman that helped me. And it was really good for that first year because for that first year, I was like, I, I, I'm supposed to be doing this? You know, it's February and you see some out because we're having that nice little week of weather or March. Are they supposed to be outside their hive? Like, you know, you go through all that. It's good to have that mentor. Take courses, you know, read, learn, research. There's many, many different types of bee associations that can really help you too. Where to locate your hive. Now I'm actually gonna go through a few things, but I don't know if you can see on this picture, on the bottom corner, you can see the three hives I have and there's blue stickers on there. Those blue stickers show you that a government inspector has come to my property and looked at those bee hives. So that's actually one of the, and I will also tell you that that government inspector um, there was no warning he was coming. He just showed up one day. And of course, and, and that's not bad. I'm just saying, so this man comes in, he comes in in a truck. And I naturally said to my husband, oh, there's someone here in a truck that I don't know. So he must be here to see you. So my husband goes out, he comes back in. He says, he's not here to see me. He's here to see you. <laughs> and he says, he wants to look at those hives. And that's what we did right away, put on a suit, went out. Um, you know, he tested them for diseases, et cetera. So again, which is a very good thing, I think that that service occurs, but I'm more just letting you know, that's what those stickers mean. So if you're thinking about beekeeping, one of the things we went through was the process. And some of these were just questions, but they have to have access to water. One of the things that bees will do is fly straight. So if you were to look at this particular photo, it's on the back of my property. So then we're gonna look and say, okay, well, call Poise Bay is in front of us. There's water, but are they gonna go that far? We have a pond on our property, which works out really well for them. But in most cases, these do not fly behind. They usually will go straight, which is quite interesting. Um, you wanna be able to know that there's lots of pollen and nectar around. Do you have a garden? Do you have flowers? Does your neighbor, you know, it's just one of those things. Um, the maximum of sun exposure, where is it? 
you know, protection from wind. You also, as a beekeeper, you want to have good access to those hives. You don't want them in the back of your property that you can't get to easily. You saw me in the beginning slide. I was on a little golf cart and I had my suit on. The reason I had that on is because when it comes to the fall and you've got to extract this honey, this honey's heavy. So if you've got to take it far, a lot of people think honey's not heavy. It's heavy. <laughs> if you've got to take it a long distance, you'll be sorry that you put your hive wherever you put it. You need to be able to get to it. You also want to make sure it can't be disturbed. I also have on there electric wire. First year I had the hives. We definitely knew that we had to protect it because where our property is, there's bears in the village. Um, first year there was a bear there. We had, they didn't come to the hive, but they got to the electric wire. So that's just something to watch. And then of course, pay attention to the regulations wherever you live for beekeeping, because there will be regulations. And so, I mean, obviously that helps by joining the associations, the government sites, et cetera. There are many different types of hives. I'm only gonna go through the hive I have experience with, and it's also the most popular hive. It's called the Langstroth hive. This just gives you an idea, just some little photos. Um, because I don't have experience with the others, I don't feel confident enough to speak with them. But you'll see different sizes. When you go to people's homes, you'll see these white. I'm gonna go back up here for a second. You can see these are relatively the same size, but you can buy smaller supers is what they're called. And we'll go into that a little bit. Um, but again, you just stack these as the season goes on. So the actual honey storage, the first, the the layers at the bottom of the beehive here, which I can't really point for you to see, but at the bottom, the taller ones, that's usually where the bees will sit. And then inside here, there are frames. So what the frames actually are is you can have, a lot of people will put 10 frames within and they actually hang in this direction. The bees will put honey on both sides. But as you see that these units go up, these big white units, you can drive by some places in the middle of summer and you'll see that they have them six or seven high. And that's okay. You just wanna make sure that it's really stable. The heavier that is going up, you'll also see one of the mistakes that I made in the beginning. You'll also see if you look at the hives, they're a little bit tilted. And you'll always think, well, oh, that's gonna fall over. And you think, my husband's a, my husband's a contractor. He's thinking everything has to be absolutely level. We've got it on our cement pads, it's level. No, you're not supposed to do that. The reason you're not supposed to do that is because why? Weather elements, you've got rain. If you've got rain and those bees are in there and you've got everything perfectly flat, there's no way for that rain to escape. You don't wanna drown your bees. You want it to be on a little bit of an angle so that when the water, if it, water was to go through, it's gonna run out. You know, key little things to think of. And so I've done that. I've gone by people's fields and I'm thinking, well, that's pretty crooked. It's supposed to be. Um, so the life cycle of a honeybee, there are eight stages. And because we don't see it as people, because it's all done in the hive, I thought you might be a little bit interested in it. So the queen actually lays all her eggs in what's called a comb. So when you saw that frame going around, it looks like the little honeycomb that we're used to seeing. But there has to be um, wax that's put on there and the workers put that on. And what they actually do is they'll make them all the same size except for around the edge. Around the edge, they'll make them a little bigger. The queen actually knows by the measurement, it's perfectly the shape that we expect, she will lay a female in there. If it's a little larger, she will put a drone in there. And the reason she will is because they're actually physically bigger. So then they hatch into what's called larva. And it looks just like you think. It looks like a little white worm, which I have a picture of it too. The larva has to be fed by the nurse bees. We talked about how there was workers and they had different roles as the nurse. And then the larva actually, they'll cap it. And that's what they're actually doing in this photo. So what's actually happening is, I do have another one a little bit later, but you'll actually see the larva and then they start to cap it. And the reason they cap it is because then it's gonna transform into an adult. So it's kind of like you think about caterpillar going into the cocoon, coming out as the butterfly. The adult actually chooses its way out of the cell. So 
this is kind of how they look when they start. So as I said, she goes in, she lays one egg in each of those. And she will know, the big key is she'll choose whether to lay it fertilized or unfertilized, which as I said, unfertilized is the drone. The fertilized is female. And she will lay at her peak of production. So say she lives two to four years. In her year two, she's gonna lay 1500 eggs a day. Like incredible amounts. So after it's been laid within three days, it'll hatch into, as I said, this larva. So there's a better picture of what the larva looks like. So the first two days they're feeding all of the females in there, they feed them royal jelly for two days. And that's really key. So it's a special food by the nurse bees. But royal jelly in the end, they decide really quick. So after that first two days, they go, no, all these other female bees, you're going to be workers. And this one is going to be your queen. And then they keep feeding that queen the royal jelly. She's the only one who gets it for four and a half days. So that's also why that queen bee ends up being bigger. Because she's getting all this royal jelly and the others aren't. So after five and a half days, the larva, that's when it's completed its thing um, development and it moves to the next stage, and begins cleaning. So you can see that all this happens really quick. It's kind of like, okay, they're born, they do this, they start cleaning, they're a nurse, they're a forger. Everything's done super fast. The drone, the male, he is fed the same diet for six days. Believe it or not, he doesn't know how to feed himself. And again, that's something, <laughs> and I'm not making fun of it. It's just something that I find really bizarre when I was researching all this in the beginning, they're kind of like, okay, you have this queen that you're feeding all this super stuff to, and then you have the workers that are working, and then you have the drone, and okay, you're feeding him longer, and he doesn't know how to feed himself, and it's just interesting, the whole concept, but as I said, they have, that's why they all have to work together, because if they didn't, they wouldn't make it, so then the transformation actually begins, so you can actually see here, a bee is actually chewing. It's, it's actually a drone that's coming out of here, but it's actually coming out of that wax piece. The interesting part here again is a female bee will take 21 days to transform. A male will take 24. The queen will only take 16. And it's because she is fed the better. So, and they also, they need that queen born. Like if you're a beekeeper and you lose your queen, you start calculating, like, okay, do I let them do it by nature? And if I let them do it by nature, okay, you've already learned that they have to fly somewhere, they have to get mated, they have to come back. So, okay, that's one aspect, so I could buy a queen first, or if I wait for them to do it, they have to lay it, then they have to feed it, then they have to cap it, and then I have to wait 16 days. So right away, you're kind of realistically, you're almost at three weeks. Well, if you lose your queen and you lose your queen in August, you don't have three weeks to spare because you have to get that hive ready for winter. And we're going to go into some of that. So they're key little things that that's why I said it's really good to have a mentor because in most of mine you say, oh, okay, it'll happen in 16 days. No, you, you hope it will, but there's other pieces to it. So a lot of people talk about why we need bees. And I mean, most of us know why we need bees. But there's a few other areas that, again, I didn't, I didn't know existed, and maybe it's just me, but I'm hoping you'll find it interesting too. Um, we think about our first thing. We think about honey. We think about beeswax. You know, we think about, you know, the pollen that they make. We think about the bee food. But one of the key things, obviously, is their environmental service to us because we can't live without them. So one third of North American crops depend on the honeybee specifically and their pollination. Now, if you think about it, one third's a lot. We're gonna go into a little bit more detail a little bit, just so you know. So why I did things kind of laid out here, so it kind of flows, so I hope it flows for you okay, but bees have hair all over the whole body. And I mean, they even have hair on their eyes. And the reason they do is because when they're going into that flower, to get that pollen, nature's very much said the easiest way to do it is okay, we're going to have it's going to collect on here quickly, then they're going to move it 
right? So they actually carry it, they move it. Um, the foragers, as I said, they only live the six weeks at the end. They're eating the entire time they're out there. So their job is they're working, but they're going, they're getting the pollen, they're eating at the same time, they're collecting, going back to the hive, like it's constant for them. So because of this, what you'll actually see here, there's a big piece of pollen on this bee. So they actually rub the pollen off the hair, down their body and collect it. And so you'll have what they call a pollen basket because it fly, it sits there really well when they're flying. You can actually see when you go to the hive, if you've got at the door at the entrance, when they're coming in, you can see the pollen attached to all the bees. And what will happen is there'll be another bee there and they'll help them get it off. So that, again, working together, right? So, I mean, we need all this for the ecosystem, number one, right? I didn't realize, you know, it affects the fruits, the vegetables, the nuts, the seeds. Before we actually moved to Culpo's, I always had a garden. But I would get the cucumbers that, you know, were curled or whatever. And I, I was still glad because they were a cucumber. But once you have bees on your property, because it's the pollination that actually makes things form properly. So that's when you'll get a cucumber that's straight. You will get, now, you will also get, we have mounds of hills. We have pumpkins on them, squash on them, you know, different things. That's when you'll get what's called cross-pollination. And what'll happen is a bee will go and they'll go into the flower of the pumpkin, and then they'll go into the flower of the squash. And then they might go into the flower of the zucchini. So what ends up happening is, some of my zucchini are really hard, like a squash, <laughs> right? Because they've done that cross-pollination. The only way to avoid that is separate them out more. But again, that's something I'm learning kind of like, oh, okay, that didn't really work quite like I wanted. This year I have some really interesting um, aspects, but my chickens love it, so it all works out. <laughs> um, but as I said earlier, one third of our human diet usually comes from an insect pollinated plants. And the USDA estimates that the honeybee is responsible for 80% of that pollination. So without I hear people say without the bees, this I did not know existed. There is actually what's called pollination services. Some beekeepers actually rent out their active hives and they rent them out, people take them on trucks and they move them to be with people's crops. And the reason they do it is because the bees that are just here, because the volume has gone down, they can't pollinate as much as they need to. So people actually, like almonds, as I said, key, key, key for pollination. And so they actually, it says here, it'll take more than half of the country's commercially operated colonies to cover just California almonds. So when you think about that bag of almonds you grow in the grocery, you buy in the grocery store, if you didn't have those bees and you didn't have a beekeeper that actually rented their hives, and you literally see them go down the road in transport trucks. Now I pay attention, but I didn't notice that before, but it does happen. So a lot of people will say to me, well, what are you doing? You know, so throughout the year, there are different things that we have to actually do. In springtime, when it, that is a key time for starvation for your bees. And I mean spring by like really early, like late February, March, depending on what the weather is. If the weather's super cold, it's not really an issue, but you will start to see them. This past year, they were out beginning of March because we had really warm days. But that's when they will start if they have not had enough honey in their hive because flowers aren't out yet. So you'll usually see supplemented feeding occur at that point, and that will happen by the beekeeper. So the queen, because she starts to start laying, they need that. Um, if you have protected your hive as far as weather-wise, you're going to remove it in spring. There's also what's called a bottom entrance on the hive. You close it up in the winter so it's quite small. So the bees can go in and out all winter if they want to, but really there's only probably about three or four where in the summertime, I have a long space that they can go out and they can go to the top. In the spring, you also do, I'm not gonna go into big detail because obviously this is an introduction on diseases, but in the spring, um, you do what's called mite prevention. 
and you also do it in the fall, but it is a medication route that you do. We can talk about it in a little bit more detail. Mites are everywhere and they occur everywhere and you can pretty much assume that if you buy honey anywhere in the world, those bees will have been affected by mites. Mites do not affect us as humans, but it does affect the bees. What actually happens is, you see this on the larva, those are little tiny mites. They actually um, attach themselves and eat the blood of the bee. And so what they end up doing is affecting the bees and bee system. So the mite survives by the bees' bloods, but eventually the bees' immune system just can't deal with this. So in the springtime, you actually treat your hive for mites. So it doesn't, again, it doesn't hurt the honeybee and it doesn't hurt us, but you wanna to try to get rid of these mites because it'll just keep eating the blood of the honeybees and eventually they will just perish. So that is the key thing. So you'll often see people treating first thing in the spring. When you're treating your hive, and some people will say, oh, why are you not starting to stack your hive up? If you've got medicine in that hive, you're not stacking your hive because you don't want, you just want it to contain right with the beach. You don't want to go into another area. Some people also talk about their hives. They failed over the winter. That's when they'll find out, did they survive? So a few things could happen, might not happen over the winter, but the queen can be replaced. They might just decide as a whole group that you know she's her production is low, her pheromone, her pheromones decrease. So as soon as they start to know her smell is going down, they know she's aging. So they will choose someone else to either replace her. In most cases, they'll try, um, or you have to replace her. So a couple of things will actually happen. And hives also fail because people get too excited in the beginning with their beekeeper and they check the hives too much. Well, that's not good for the bees. You have to kind of layer how often you're going to do these things. Bees starving, which we talked about, bees being infected with other kinds of diseases or are diseases that will actually kill them. Or the bees just abandon the hive. We can talk about that. And there's something that's called colony collapse disorder. And there's not really a lot of about why this happens. It's other things are happening. One, they think it's a combination of, whoops, we're losing our internet connection. Um, they think it happens because of numerous pesticides, obviously the disease stressors, because our farming has changed how we farm in the sense of, you know, you might not have that field of flowers beside us because we might have a hundred acres that's all workable now. Where before, you know, hundred years ago, everybody kind of had little farms flowers were in between. So that actually has stressed some things too. And then another big one is exposure to can contaminated water. Swarming. So um, I actually did have a swarm two years ago. So anyone who was close to me as a neighbor, I called and told them I had a swarm. Um, that was actually very interesting because you see it on documentaries, you see it on TV, you will see. And what actually happens is they decide beforehand the hive's either too crowded or they want to get rid of that queen. And that main queen will take off and she will take two thirds of the hive with her. And it will happen in a split second. So I was in the backyard and all of a sudden you could just hear. If you think about the noise of a honeybee and then you think about what 7,000 honeybees might be like, it's instantaneous. They all fly out, they fly onto a tree just like this. They'll stay there for a little bit and then they'll fly away. And so as a beekeeper, you can try to find them. I was not successful because they usually know ahead of time where they're going to go. They've got a tree hollow somewhere. They've got something already staked out. Someone has already staked it out. Um, but you will also see people go and catch the swarm and bring it back. That's a whole other level, but it does happen. It's part of nature. Anyone who has beehives out there, it's part of nature. Again, they're not gonna hurt you. When you see a beehive like this, if you see it swarmed, don't panic. And truly don't panic because they are very docile. They are more docile in this position than they are at their hive. Because at that point, all they wanna do is just find their new home. They won't hurt you. The queen is actually inside. 
And so a lot of people will just go and they'll go with a box, knock down the swarm and take it in the box and put it right away into what's called a new, a new box. But as I said, it's not something to panic about. In the summertime, what are you going to do? You're going to watch for swarms. You're going to watch for predators. You're going to watch for diseases. Um, you want to make sure that the progression of the hive is still intact. So that frame that we sent about earlier, you can see that someone's pulled out a frame here. See all the bees on it? That's a lot of times what it looks like when you pull them out. There are a lot of bees. Um, and then obviously you're going to see how are they doing on their honey stores. You're not going to take honey in the summertime, but you're going to see how are they doing. What is honey? I mean, we know honey is thick. We know it's sugary. We know it's a fluid, but it's made out of flower and nectar. This I find fascinating. One honeybee in their lifetime is only equal to a twelfth of a teaspoon of honey. So you think of how hard they work for you to have that teaspoon of honey in your tea. So one pound of honey is their life's work of 560 bees. Now, the other interesting part of it is most of the sugar that's in the honey is not available in the nectar. So it's not like you can go out to your flower and go with the pollen and try to make it yourself. It doesn't work because what actually happens is the enzymes within the honeybee's mouth are what make all this honey occur. So a lot of people think, well, I'll just do it myself. You can't. It's a chemical reaction. You'll hear people talk about it. Is it a high energy food? It's easy, easily digestible. So a lot of people will definitely substitute honey for sugar. It does have antibacterial qualities. A few things that come here are the next ones. Eating local honey helps people with allergies. That I can tell you, number one, is a very true statement. It's like when you talked about, people talked about the 100 mile market, honey's is the same. If you eat the honey that's in your area, it will help your allergies because it's right here. The other thing it does is it aids in healing. I can tell you 100%, we have horses. Anybody who knows where we are, we have horses. If those horses get injured, the number one thing a vet will tell you to do is put on local raw honey. And that's a vet telling you that. We have had um, some injuries with our horses. I have used honey every year. Um, because of the high sugar content, honey has an indefinite shelf life. You'll hear people say, oh, I found a jar of honey in my grandmother's basement. It's probably been there 100 years. It's okay to eat. You know, honey was in the tubes. Um, all honey, though, will eventually crystallize. So a lot of people think the minute it crystallizes, it's bad. It's not. All you have to do is just set it in some hot water. Don't put it in your microwave because then all you're doing is deactivating everything that's there that's good. Um, but yeah, just put in some hot water, you'll get it back. But it isn't bad. It's absolutely normal. Extracting honey. This is actually probably the funnest part of beekeeping um, is when it's time to harvest. So you'll have the, this top picture here is one of those frames of mine. It was full of honey and it's got wax all on it. And then you start to take the wax off. So the top frame is me starting to take the, the wax off. What you want to do, number one, is you want to look at the honey stores that are in your hives. A bottom large super of, of, uh, of the hive itself can weigh about 80 pounds for sure. You lift those things up, they're hard to lift. But you need, realistically, in our weather, because we have winter longer than most, so a lot of places will say, you know, 60 to 80 pounds of honey is what they need for the winter. Here we usually say keep two supers full. So you'll see hives stacked too high. That's just their food. Don't touch that. Anything above that that you've collected for the year, that's the honey that you can take because they don't need that. But they need these two bottom ones completely full. Um, I, the very first year, again, have hives going up. I'm thinking, I can do this on my own. Yeah, I'm a big, tall girl. I go out there and I go to pick up this top super and I've got the smaller one up there. So it's only about this deep compared to here. So I go to pick it up and it's above me because at this point I've got five levels up. I go to lift this off and I can't lift it because one, it's at a really awkward position and that honey is heavy. So as I said, honey is heavy. So it's good. That's when it's good to have somebody else with you. 
So what I ended up doing this year was I ended up taking out bins, unloading a few trays at a time, putting in the bins, putting on the lids really quickly. <laughs> but then I ended up using the golf cart because I needed to carry this. It was difficult to carry. And then in the fall. So I consider right now the fall when I'm actually saying fall. When they need to be really well ventilated because you want to make sure that you don't suffocate the bees. But you also want to protect from wind. And you want to protect from mice. Mice are not going to hurt the bees. That's number one. I'll put that right up. Mice are not a threat in that way. But mice will make a real mess of your hives. Because they'll have a nest in there. They'll everything else. So what a lot of people do is they'll protect the entrances. They'll put little steel grids there. Um, you're going to put medication in again in the fall. So when I was asked to do this presentation, I didn't know, I was kind of like, well, do you want me to bring things? I said, I can't really bring things because, you know, this is medication time, et cetera, because you want to actually go in and medicate now so that they, again, are, you're dealing with that mite issue. And then this protection on the outside. This is a black, um, it's almost plastic and it's like corrugated plastic is what it is. And it goes actually around the hive. And so again, it's just another way to keep it warm. Some beekeepers use it. Some people actually wrap them. Some don't do anything. Um, but this is the time of year that you do that. And then in the winter itself, again, I'm saying, remember to always make sure there's honey left. And if the beekeeper decides they're gonna harvest too much and they're not gonna do that rule, kind of like, oh, okay, they're all right. They probably won't make it through winter. So that's a key thing when I said bees die in the spring, because usually they start to death. So you want to make sure that they're definitely okay. And then at the beginning, I talked about the stink. So I saved this for the end, just in the sense that we already know the drone can't sting you. The female, she is the one who's going to sting you, but that venom's actually injected into your flesh, right? So it goes in, and then when you try to pull out that apparatus, what happens is you're pulling the stinger out. She only has the ability to sting once. Once a bee actually stings you, she dies. They don't want to sting. And I'm referring to a honeybee here, first of all, a honeybee. A honeybee can only sting once. So a lot of times you'll see a honeybee land on your hand. They're not gonna sting you because they know that's what's going to occur. When will they sting? They'll sting when they're, as I said, trying to defend something. Um, they'll sting if they feel trapped. I mean, that's an easy way to say that. Um, but the biggest thing that stings the most is wasps. They will sting over and over again. So, and that's where people get confused. So my husband, when we first got the honeybees, he was not thrilled about getting honeybees. He was kind of like, why do they want these? Like, here, now here's this man who deals with these big horses all the time, but did he want this honeybee around? No way. But then he started to be very calm too. Once I said to him, I said, they, they won't hurt you. They, they can, I'm not gonna say they can't, but it's not their intention. And so he would get to the point where they don't be all around him. And as long as you're calm, they really aren't going to sting you. And so now he's much, you know, he will now say to people, Oh, they really don't want to. Mind you, if I see a wasp in the yard and my grandkids are there, I'm like, okay, that's not a honeybee. <laughs> the only bee that can hurt you as a honeybee that over and over again is the queen. She can sting multiple times. She's usually, as I said, she's not going to go anywhere though. She's in that hive. She only leaves twice. She either leaves to mate or she leaves to swarm. Otherwise, that queen stays in that hive her entire life and lays 1,500 eggs a day. So she works hard. <laughs> and as I said earlier, the males can't. So I know I've kind of thrown a lot of information at you and I hope it helps to understand a little bit more about honeybees. Um, does anybody have any questions for me? There's two things you can actually, well, there's three things. Um, so you can actually feed them sugar water um, and it's ratio. So in the fall, if you need to supplement, say they don't have enough storage, 
you actually give them um, thicker sugar water. In the spring, it's diluted one to one because you want the water ratio in there. Um, you can also make what's called bee candy that's like a thick pollen. So you can do that too. So actually, you buy it from a bee store. It's not something that I create. Um, there are two kinds. I think there's three probably, but um, it is, yes, it's an actual product that actually hangs within the frames and that goes after the mite because the mite actually will eventually, the bees will crawl on it, they will crawl on it and they just don't like each other. And then the other one that I feed, um, it's, it's almost like a waxed, it's not pollen, but it looks almost like, almost looks like a thick candy, even though it's not. Um, and that doesn't affect your honey or anything like that way. And it just does the same thing. Yeah. So it's not like you're spraying anything. You're just kind of setting it in there. To set up a hive, you're usually about $500. And the reason I'm giving that as a price is because you end up having to buy a bee suit. You have to buy the boxes that they're in, the frames that they're in. Um, if you choose to buy an extractor, that's totally different. I'm not really referring to that right now. I'm just referring to Hive itself. You can buy what's called a nuke from a beekeeper. Um, and that'll actually be like a small hive. And those vary in price because it depends on what you're going to start with. But they kind of give a rule of thumb of, say, $500 a hive. Once you've got that first hive, those big costs you're not doing, right? Because the bee suit, I have pants, I have gloves, I have, you know, the bee suit itself is over $100. So that's, but you're not doing that again. But it just kind of gives you an idea. It really truly doesn't take a lot of time as much as it takes a lot more observation. Um, it takes definitely time in summer. Um, no, that's not true. I would say it probably takes the most in spring because in the spring I'm actually watching to make sure they have their food. So over a year, when I extract the honey, my, my first year that I had hives, I had 77 pounds of honey that I harvested. This year I had 145 pounds. Um, that extraction process takes a while. Like that takes me a good solid two to three days because I don't have the high tech equipment. I have a manual extractor, you know, like, you know, the bigger people that have the electronic extractors, that's different. I only can put three frames in at a time. There are other people that can have 16, but those are, those are, that's not the backyard beekeeper. That's not that equipment. Okay. And I guess that sort of answers the question about, how much would you get from one hive in one year? So yeah. it's three hives? I have three hives and I just said it was 144 pounds. Yeah. She's laying from early spring, like early, as I said, she's already starting in February and she will stop pretty much laying by September because they don't want, you know, more bees occurring. Right, they want them just to kind of tone down. Some people do it twice a year. I only do it once a year. I only do it in the fall. Some people will actually do it in the spring. Um, I think that's just personal preference. Um, I don't because I like them to have access because my logic is I don't know how the flowers are going to occur in the sense of, you know, is it going to be a long, there, there's some years we've got beautiful, you know, blossoms for a long period of times. And then this past year, we had a frost really early and it hurt a lot of those blossoms. So I, that's why I don't want to take anything early by the fall. I kind of know, and you can see the difference in your honey. You can see like, I, again, me being the backyard beekeeper, um, the honey that they start um, the honey that you could extract in early fall in those lower frames, it's definitely a darker color than the honey that you're extracting from the very, very top because they've got so many blossoms here. And then the other thing that's occurring is they're doing a lot of tracking up in 
down that honey trail too because they're going through the whole hive. But you can tell the difference. Um, I will tell you a funny little story is there's a lady in Cowboys here, um, has cherry trees and plum trees. And the first year I was here for Christmas, I gave everybody on the street some honey at Christmas time. And she came up to me after she said, I had no idea you had honeybees. I said, oh yeah. She goes, my trees have done so well this year. She said, I've lived here for years. She said, I have not had the plums I had till this year. I said, yeah, because I said, you are straight from my house. <laughs> she was like, I am so thankful. <laughs> See on this picture of the hive at the bottom, there's an entrance there, the slot, and that slot, whichever way it's going, there are two entrances for them to get out of at the top, but they're small. So that's when they will tend to go backwards. But as I said, they're usually going to that entryway. When they fly back in, they're flying that way. So I've purposely put my hives so they are headed towards the water and our pond. About five miles is their radius. Yes. plant <laughs> plant anything that has blossoms anything you know flowers um vegetables and all of those things because those all help and you do benefit especially if it's vegetables because as i said you're getting you know the cross pollination you're getting the pollination but flowers is key um and not with either and as i said and don't panic when you see it in the sense of you know Make sure they're a wasp if you're going to. Wasps have a pur purpose too, but as I said, a lot of people will be out like, oh, I've got to get rid of all these bees. I actually had one woman say this year, she was, oh, I'm going to take down all those plants because there's too many bees attracted to them. And I went up to him and said, those aren't bees. I said, those are all wasps. So again, it's just taking away something before you realize what you're taking away. It is the same, except the pollen obviously is, yeah. And when it's um, that really yellow, the nectar's more like the liquid where they can get, cause they have a really long tongue that just kind of, you know, in and out, in and out. Um, so yeah, they're very intriguing. And as I said, uh, now, as I said, I, I find them very fascinating, but I think it's that I don't have a fear of them. I have got stung. I'm not gonna tell you I haven't got stung. But every time I've got stung, I've got stung once a year, like each year, and it's always been my own fault. As I said, it's always been my fault. The one time was my own fault. I saw that there was a bee go into my carrier that I was carrying, and I told myself, remember the bees in there. And I took off my glove, and I forgot the bee was in there. You know, it was things like that, the queen bee I told you about. Um, and then there was one other year, I can't remember what I did, but again, it was my fault. And what about when you didn't have your foot on? Um, I that hurts <laughs> um, because they actually stung me right on my lip, so it, it did hurt. But as again, it, it was my fault because I really should have had the hood on. <laughs>